you, Reg. Um, well, actually, Re Reg is in indirectly responsible for the beginning of my career as a graduate student. It was through his brother that I read a paper that Reg wrote with Arthur Kornberg on how the uh, DNA polymerase excises thymine dimers from UV irradiated DNA. And that beautiful paper was what uh, encouraged me to consider Stanford and, and Arthur Kornberg as my PhD mentor. So I'm grateful to you for that, Reg. Uh, well, I'm not going to talk about my own science uh, today. Um, that would be another seminar. Instead, I'm going to talk, as Reg indicated, about um, something that was both personally and professionally important to me. I'll tell you uh, a little bit about um, what we know about Parkinson's disease, some of the uh, genetic hallmarks of the disease for those patients who have familial forms of the disease, and what prospects there are for uh, treating such patients. Uh, they're limited for the time being, but we have um, prospects. I'll tell you about my own personal involvement with an effort uh, that is supported by the Sergey Brin Family Foundation. I'll tell you more about Brin and his interest in Parkinson's disease. But first, let's uh, talk a little bit about what really is a, a worldwide pandemic, the Parkinson's pandemic. It has, um, this is on a time delay, okay. It is growing in incidence uh, with an estimated uh, 20 million cases, uh, perhaps in the next decade. It's growing more rapidly even than Alzheimer's disease. Of course, it's a disease of age, but uh, there also is a very strong genetic component that I will emphasize in my remarks. Uh, it obeys, like the pandemic that we've suffered through, it obeys no geographic boundaries. It's estimated that uh, almost half of the new cases in the world emerging today and with increasing incidence uh, will emerge from China. So it's a huge problem with um, many millions of patients afflicted with the disease uh, in, in China. Now, of course, um, the disease has been recognized for now around 200 years and the pharmaceutical industry has invested considerable resources in trying to attack the disease. But one of the major problems in approaching a disease as complex as Parkinson's is it's likely not a single disease. It's a, rather a spectrum disorder where patients can present sometimes, um, this is on a slow time delay here. Uh, some, some patients have a rapid onset of the disease. They develop dementia, approximately 30% of patients who suffer from Parkinson's, eventually suffer from dementia. These patients often have low survival. Uh, on the other hand, there are patients such as Michael J. Fox, who's had the disease for now uh, more than three decades, long survival, slow uh, disability, little dementia evident in, in him and in others who uh, are afflicted at a very young age, sometimes in their 20s and early 30s, as opposed to the usual late onset form of the disease. So how can you treat a disease that presents with different symptoms, different rates of progression, different kinds of um, uh, uh, maladies? How, how can you call this one disease? Nonetheless, the pharmaceutical industry has for too long uh, considered it one disease and has tried to develop drugs that fit all. And you can see by this depiction on the left that Many drug trials, having gone through phase three, have, uh, have failed. Uh, in fact, there are no drugs that change the arc of the disease. There are drugs such as dopamine replacement or a neurosurgical procedure, deep brain stimulation, that can uh, modify the symptoms. But uh, even if the, if the symptoms are well controlled, as in some patients they can be, uh, the disease inexorably progresses and patients die for a variety of reasons. Uh, they may develop pneumonia. They may have problems swallowing. Uh, very common uh, malady that, uh, uh, that, approach, that, that uh, afflicts people as they progress is orthostatic hypotension. So this can be very dangerous as uh, in addition to balance problems, people can pass out and, uh, and harm themselves seriously through um, some aspect of cardiophysiology that's not really perfectly understood. 
Now let's talk about uh, some of the um, specific issues that uh, are known in the disease. My, uh, okay, so a hundred years ago, a uh, British clinician uh, by the name of Frederick Louis discovered in brain sections of uh, patients uh, plaques that could be seen within cells, particularly within a region of the brain in the midbrain, the substantia nigra, where dopaminergic neurons are clustered. If you, uh, and this was, was known probably before Louis, but if you cut sections through a patient who died for other reasons, in the midbrain, you can see a cluster of cells, some tens of thousands of dopaminergic neurons that also accumulate melanin and, and can be stained in a relatively simple fashion to reveal this band of cells in a normal, in a normal person dying for other reasons. However, a patient who died of Parkinson's disease, uh, uh, many of these cells are already gone and fail to register with this melanin stain. In fact, people who uh, present in middle age or later with Parkinson's, a movement disorder, have already lost over half of their dopaminergic neurons. And you'll see in a bit why these neurons are so vulnerable, why they seem to be uh, selectively uh, destroyed um, even when mutations cause defects throughout the body. They seem to be focused particularly on the dopaminergic neurons. Now back to uh, Louis's work. He discovered in sections of brains of patients who died of Parkinson's, uh, these clusters of plaques that are within cells. These are not like amyloid uh, bodies that are extracellular. These are plaques within the cell, and they have been given the name Louis bodies. Louis bodies consist of uh, clusters of aggregated proteins and organelles and filaments. One of the major proteins that's a constituent of Louis bodies is a, um, a protein called alpha-synuclein, uh, which was first actually described as a protein associated with synaptic vesicles. Uh, its function, its normal function is still not entirely clear, but uh, certain mutations in the alpha-synuclein gene or in patients who have a triplication of the normal gene, this protein aggregates and uh, appears to form a nucleus around which other proteins and organelles may, may cluster to form these Lewy bodies. Now, unfortunately, it's not possible to evaluate Lewy bodies in a, in a patient. It only can be seen in sections of biopsies after a patient has died. So it's not possible then to evaluate the progression of these Lewy bodies. It's only possible to kind of try to reconstruct their accumulation within the brain uh, as uh, patients die at later stages. Uh, of course, it's tempting, but I think dangerous to conclude that these Lewy bodies are the reason for dopaminergic neuronal de death. In fact, in patients who progress um, into dementia, these Lewy bodies can be seen to be to spread throughout the brain, not just focused in, in uh, the substantia nigra. And you may recall that uh, the, com the comedian Robin Williams, uh, who committed suicide uh, after shortly after he was diagnosed with Parkinson, had a raging form of, of the disease that affected his uh, not just his cognitive skills, but emotionally. Uh, he was uh, 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 paranoid and, uh, and uh, acted out in irrational ways and took his own life uh, as a result of the very rapid progression of the disease. His wife commissioned a biopsy of his brain after, uh, after he died, and uh, they found Lewy bodies not just in the, uh, in the um, substantia nigra, but also even in the amygdala, which may have been his, uh, the source of his fearful reactions, but, it, but spread throughout the brain, really a, a massive spread. Still, it's not clear that it was the Lewy bodies as opposed to something else that led to the uh, progress progressive death of his dopaminergic neurons. Now, it's possible in the laboratory to recapitulate uh, the appearance of these Lewy bodies. And here's an experiment uh, uh, that was uh, conducted in Switzerland using primary uh, cortical neurons that were transfected uh, with uh, alpha-synuclein so as to overexpress the protein. And here you can see in an immunofluorescence image a very large spot of alpha-synuclein in this uh, neuronal cell. And uh, in electron micrograph thin sections with a false color, you can see that this, these structures are quite elaborate. It's not just like amyloid, a pure protein. It's quite a collection of many things that have aggregated. It may be 
that these aggregates are a, a way to kind of sequester this toxic material and make it less uh, damaging, or it could be that these are the source of pathology. Now, in a reconstruction of the apparent progression of Lewy bodies within the brains of patients who died uh, for various reasons at different stages in the progression of Parkinson's, uh, a physician in Germany, uh, Brock, um, uh, has formed the model, which is given his name, called the Brock hypothesis, which suggests that Lewy bodies uh, may originate in uh, uh, even in the vagus nerve. They may come up uh, from the gut through the vagus nerve into the uh, base of the brain. There is some reason to think that patients who have Parkinson's very early on may have symptoms of gut disorder, constipation, uh, not a clear diagnosis of Parkinson's, but very often progresses to Parkinson's. Uh, patients who've died at later stages uh, um, in, in Brock's hypothesis seem to have Lewy bodies that spread elsewhere um, uh, beyond the midbrain into cortical regions where these structures or some uh, something associated with the structures may cause emotional and cognitive distress, um, which is common for those patients who suffer from dementia with Parkinson's. Now I'm going to uh, tell you about a few examples of uh, particular uh, genes uh, implicated in Parkinson's and what we know about their cell biology and biochemistry. These are targets for therapeutic intervention, but of course no one mutation uh, can account for a very large fraction of patients who suffer from Parkinson's. Nonetheless, the hope is that if we can get a foot in the door and treat patients with a particular mutant form of a gene that predisposes to Parkinson's, we can then find other things that may help other patients. So let's focus first on one of the um, particularly interesting examples of, a, of lesions that affect the ability of cells to surveil uh, their mitochondria for damage that allows damaged mitochondria to be swallowed up by the lysosome in a process called uh, mitophagy, a specialized form of autophagy. Now, this is probably a review for all of you who've uh, had introductory biology. Certainly, if you've taken my class in introductory biology, you've seen this slide. Mitochondria are an enormously important and complex organelle in the cell. Uh, there are two membranes, uh, and the inner membrane has infoldings called Christi, which organize uh, oxidative phosphorylation and electron transport. Uh, there are two elements within the mitochondria that must be protected, and a damage to the mitochondria must be resolved, uh, uh, or else this some of these things that are sequestered in the mitochondria may escape and do damage to the cell. One is the presence of a genome within the mitochondria. Mitochondria have their own small genome, um, which functions in the synthesis, in, in expression of a subset of the proteins in the electron transport chain. A damaged mitochondria spill their uh, chromosome into the cytoplasm, and cells have a, a mechanism to uh, 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 an alarm system that warns cells that there's been some damage uh, and it sets off a uh, path that leads to apoptotic death. So any damaged mitochondria have to be removed before the mitochondria are exposed to this signaling event in the cytoplasm of the cell. Another uh, potential damaging trigger is at the end of the electron transport chain, a superoxide uh, radical is created and held in uh, the complex four at the end of the electron transport chain. If the mitochondrion is damaged, this superoxide can escape and it can diffuse very rapidly and do damage to chromosomal DNA. So for those two reasons and probably others, the mitochondria must be um, uh, protected and uh, removed if it's damaged. Well, here's uh, the pathway that I've uh, mentioned and which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, it's a pr process of uh, mitophagy, a subset of autophagy, where uh, damaged organelles, damaged mitochondria or other organelles are tagged, and you'll see how they're tagged in a moment. They're tagged uh, and recognized as um, subject to disposal. They become enveloped in a large uh, leaflet of membrane called the phagophore, which surrounds the damaged organelles, and the phagophore membrane, now mature to an autophagosome, fuses with the lysosome where its internalized compartments are uh, subject to hydrolytic enzymes and degraded to amino acids, sugars, and nucleotides. 
So that surveillance mechanism must work uh, uh, with uh, near perfection to uh, limit the damage that may accrue if a mitochondrion releases DNA or superoxide radical. Now, I tell you this uh, because there are two genes, uh, not so common, but there are two genes in familial forms of Parkinson's called uh, PINK1 and PARKIN that are responsible for tagging, uh, recognizing and tagging damaged mitochondria. Uh, much of the work has been done by a terrific biochemist cell biologist named Richard Ewell at the NIH, and I'll summarize just a bit of what he's found. Uh, PINK1 and PARKIN encode enzymes that uh, ubiquitolate proteins exposed on the outer surface of the mitochondrion. And uh, it, they have a specific way, PINK1 and PARKIN have a specific way of recognizing damage to the mitochondrion. If the membrane potential that um, mobilizes the flow of protons in the electron transport chain, if that membrane potential is dissipated by damage to the organelle or by use of a chemical agent that dissipates membrane potential, um, a protein, one of these two proteins, PINK1, um, uh, can become lodged in the outer membrane of the mitochondrion. And when it's lodged in place, it is an active ubiquitin ligase uh, that uses a phosphorylated form of ubiquitin to tag proteins in the neighborhood. Normally, if the mitochondrion is not damaged, a pink one enters the mitochondrion, is cleaved at its end terminus, and then quickly exits so that it is no longer in proximity to anything on the mitochondrial surface, and so no tagging occurs. So this is really quite dramatic, and I have, an, as an example, um, a slide from Ewell's work that shows uh, the recruitment of Parkin, which can be seen uh, when mitochondria are depolarized with an agent that dissipates membrane potential. Parkin is distributed throughout the cytoplasm of this uh, cultured cell, but it focuses on mitochondria uh, when the membrane is when the mitochondrial membrane is depolarized likewise ubiquitin which is largely dispersed within the cytoplasm of the cell accumulates at, in the same location coincident with parkin until with time these uh, tagged mitochondria are swallowed up and degraded in the lysosome so either uh, mutations in either pink one or parkin uh, eliminate this tagging function and so mitochondria persist uh, and the damaged mitochondria persist, and the cell inevitably then is propelled into an apoptotic death. So that's um, two genes, uh, alpha-synuclein, and now like, three genes, pink one and Parkin. Let me tell you about one last one that's particularly interesting. Uh, this is the work of many investigators, um, most notably uh, Dario Lessi and his colleagues in Dundee, Scotland, have worked on a gene called LARC2. LARC2 is a kind of an indolent protein kinase with a very low turnover uh, rate. Mutations in familial forms uh, of the LARC2 uh, LARC LARC gene um, activate this indolent uh, protein kinase and turn on its activity you know, as little as twofold. And as little as a twofold increase in its activity is enough to give a, a pathologic effect. It's a very complex uh, protein, this, this uh, protein kinase that has a GTP binding regulatory domain as well as a, uh, an ATP binding domain for the kinase. But suffice it to say that um, mutations in this gene in familial forms of Parkinson's uh, are dominant alleles. So carriers have a significant uh, uh, risk associated with the development of the disease. So um, in reconstructing uh, how this more active form of LARC2 does its damage, uh, Dario Lessi, in collaboration with colleagues elsewhere in Europe, discovered that the hyperactivated form of LARC2 phosphorylates a subset of so-called RAB proteins. RAB proteins are small GTP binding proteins. There are several dozen of them in the human genome, and each one of them uh, informs a particular direction that vesicles may take in, in a variety of pathways. They are kind of marker proteins that orient the vesicle for targeting to a particular uh, membrane for fusion. A subset of RAB proteins are hyperphosphorylated by the activated form of LARC2, 
Uh, Alessi, uh, now in collaboration with Suzanne Pfeffer at Stanford, have discovered that the uh, phosphorylated forms of Rab uh, proteins in cells that appear to communicate with dopaminergic neurons, cells in the striatum, cholinergic neurons, or interneurons in the striatum of the brain, uh, when they have hyperactivated Rab proteins, in particular one called Rab10, the primary cilium on these cells no longer forms. So something about phosphorylated Rabs influences and in interferes with the biosynthesis of a primary cilium. Uh, now, this is terribly important for communication between a cholinergic neuron in the striatum and the dopaminergic neuron because the cilium is the receiving antenna uh, for a, a hedgehog signaling pathway that allows dopaminergic neurons to communicate with their target. So in a normal uh, arrangement where the dopaminergic neuron projects uh, one of its million uh, nerve, nerve endings into the striatum, uh, the uh, cilium on the target cell uh, and hedgehog signaling pathway elicits the secretion of GDNF by the cholinergic neuron, which in turn is recognized by the dopaminergic neuron to sustain its viability. Ongoing production of GDNF is required for the viability of these dopaminergic neurons. And if you arrest the hedgehog pathway by not having a cilium on the target cell, you arrest the production of GDNF. And the idea is that the dopaminergic neurons then uh, are no longer viable. So that's the idea in their, in their hypothesis. And they uh, very recently found evidence in patients with rare mutations in this pathway of a, a dearth of cilia on striatal neurons. So that's a really exciting development and uh, leads to very specific predictions about at least how one might uh, um, uh, interfere or mitigate the, uh, the pathology of this disease. Uh, there's a company in South San Francisco, Denali, that has uh, developed some uh, potent inhibitors uh, of this LARC2 kinase, very specific inhibitors. They can dampen, they can titrate the inhibitor so that the twofold elevation and activity is reduced to normal. That they have a drug that passes the blood-brain barrier, so it, uh, it's now, they're now beginning phase two clinical trials. Uh, Alessi and colleagues have also found the phosphatase, a very specific protein phosphatase, that's necessary to cleave phosphate from the phosphorylated Rab proteins. And so an alternative approach that he is investigating with another biotech company is to look for activators of that, uh, of that phosphatase, which would then uh, suppress the accumulation of hyperphosphorylated Rab. So two independent orthogonal targets give hope that at least the, those patients who suffer from LARC2 mutations may have some benefit. All right, now, um, this is a, a segue to the next part of my talk. Uh, this is what you will all imagine when you think of, of nerve cells with uh, axons and dendrites and nerve terminals, obviously much more crowded in the brain. But what many of you may not have ever seen, and certainly was an amazing, uh, observe, uh, an amazing slide to me, was the appearance of a dopaminergic neuron. It's perhaps the most complex nerve cell in the brain with a cell body and dendrites, but then a nerve terminal that is estimated uh, to make contacts with as many as a million different uh, target nerve cells. So it's like a forest of connections. And you can well imagine that a cell that is this complex uh, and engaged with neighbors would be vulnerable and poised uh, at the precipice of viability or death. So any damage to mitochondria, any, uh, any damage to the ATP production or damage to the lysosome as is seen in LARC2 alleles could easily influence the viability of these cells. And this may explain why mutations in genes that affect mitophagy, which should affect virtually all the cells in our body seem to focus their, their, their uh, pathologic effect on, on the substantia nigra. So anyway, so we're very hopeful that uh, new opportunities arise uh, in evaluating the biochemical and cell biological implications of the mutations in these genes. There are 20 different genes, familial forms of uh, Parkinson's that have been discovered not um, uh, not all of them can easily be understood in the pathways that I've described, so there's a great deal of work to be done. Okay, well, um, 
So my work uh, over decades has been on vesicular traffic, which has some relation to what I've just said about Parkinson's, but I didn't have any particular interest in doing anything uh, practical. I was interested in how cells work for many years, how yeast cells work, how vesicles are trafficked in yeast cells. But my life changed um, now about 25 years ago uh, when at the age of 48, my wife presented uh, with the movement disorder aspects of Parkinson's disease. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, probably um, true that she had, she had symptoms that we didn't appreciate uh, even when we were first married. Here's a picture from my wedding um, in Hutter Park near Stanford in 1973. Um, she, when we first met, she had a poorly developed sense of smell, which we didn't make anything of. It was, she, she, she could smell, but not very well. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, she developed Parkinson's disease that um, her neurologist said, oh, that's fairly common among people who progress to Parkinson's. You know, poorly developed sense of smell is not diagnostic, uh, exactly diagnostic of Parkinson's, but it is, it is a symptom as well as constipation. Well, she, uh, she was fine and we had a very happy life together, but in 1998, uh, even in the peak of her health, um, here at a, I think it was a, a holiday out to dinner, uh, she was fine, but then uh, the movement disorder set in. Uh, she never had a tremor, uh, but she had an awkward gait. Um, she lost a good, her good sense of balance. She would fall unpredictably. Um, and um, she started uh, a course of uh, dopamine replacement, a drug called cinnamon. Um, and the problem with that is it works really well for about five years, but as patients continue to take it, they develop very awkward dyskinetic movements that are associated with, with the drug as much as with the disease. Still, her disease was fairly well controlled. And in 2008, because of the progression of, of dyskinesia, her neurologist suggested that she would be a candidate for a neurosurgical procedure called deep brain stimulation, where uh, electrodes are implanted uh, bilaterally into a region called the subthalamic nucleus. And with a small discharge of about two millivolts controlled by a battery pack implanted in, in the shoulder, um, this, uh, these two bilateral targets are stimulated continuously. And for reasons that still aren't well understood, that seems to suppress uh, the uh, the directions that that create havoc in uh, this these uncontrolled dyskinetic movements. So her dyskinesia was uh, suppressed completely. Other problems, leg cramps, seemed to melt away. Um, so she was almost normal to a to a non neurologist uh, like me. She she seemed to have pretty good behavior and was well controlled. Um, Nonetheless, the disease clearly was advancing because within a couple of years after the deep brain stimulation, she started to uh, uh, develop a cognitive decline. And uh, this was perhaps the worst uh, aspect of her disease as it progressed because at a certain point when she was un unable to complete sentences, we went to the neurologist who conducted a, uh, a battery of cognitive tests and I'll never forget the day when we went to hear the results and he said, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna to have to take your driver's driving privileges away. You're no longer able to control a motor vehicle. And uh, that, 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 one, that one statement from, from her neurologist was a crushing blow. Um, uh, it affected her psychologically even more than cognitively uh, because it meant a loss of freedom. And it wasn't the kind of thing that any neurologist could have predicted. That, that's perhaps the most frustrating aspect of a disease like this. It progresses in very different ways at different rates, different symptoms. And I had access to the best neurologists uh, in the world. Uh, and they would often offer me some advice about what to expect going forward. And they were always wrong. They could never actually predict what was likely to transpire. Still, there, was, there, were, there continued to be moments of great joy. Here is uh, my, my dad and my wife uh, at the Nobel celebration in 2013. She was suffering from dementia at that point, but there were plenty of family members around to, to care for her. Well, in the years after that, it got worse. Uh, she slept during much of the, much of the day and, and evening. Uh, she, at, at times, was catatonic. I couldn't uh, give her her medication. She would appear uh, to be 
awake, but not really. Uh, she, uh, she, she just deteriorated to the point where eventually it was the orthostatic hypotension uh, that got her likely, although I, I was not aware of this. And in the end, she died in the middle of the night, likely of heart failure. Here again, no neurologist had ever warned me that this was a possible consequence. Um, so anyway, the disease uh, envelops many aspects of life and, and it's not possible to really control the outcome. Anyway, as she was uh, in deep decline, I was approached by a representative of the Sergey Brin Family Foundation. Uh, you know the name, Brin, co-founder of Google. Uh, he has a family history of, par of Parkinson's. He has the allele of LARC2, the dominant allele of LARC2. His mother is uh, ill. She's been ill for some years with Parkinson's. Uh, she and he are both carriers. Uh, so uh, in her, it's, uh, it's had a dominant effect. In, in him, he's not ill, at least not yet, but he has an enlightened self-interest and he has been investing uh, many hundreds of millions of dollars in efforts on Parkinson's disease, largely through a wonderful organization that you're all aware of called the Michael J. Fox Foundation in New York. Uh, the Fox Foundation does a, a terrific job in patient, uh, patient support and in clinical research they also fund some basic research. They were instrumental in some of the early work that Dario Alessi did. But um, several years before I became aware of, of the Brin Foundation, Mr. Brin decided that what we really needed was an entirely basic science approach to understanding Parkinson's. Uh, he felt that clinicians had had a long time and, and had not come up with anything successful. So maybe what we needed was to understand the molecular and cellular origins and means of progression of the disease, and that would require basic science. And so I was asked by the chief financial officer of his family foundation if I would uh, think about how I might help them uh, to realize that this is an initiative in basic science. And uh, when, when my wife died, I was asked to chair a committee that uh, uh, this fellow and a wonderful scientist, my sidekick in this effort, a woman named Kemeny Riley, who's a PhD trained molecular biologist in the Washington area. She and I uh, got together uh, with a committee of neuroscientists and Parkinson's experts and decided to create an organization called Aligning Science Across Parkinson's. So uh, this initiative uh, started now about three years ago. The idea was to deploy a considerable resource provided by Bryn to, to organize teams of investigators, not individual investigators, but teams of investigators brought together, not just because the, the money was being made available, but because, because I recognized and Akemeni recognized that uh, people who have engaged in enduring uh, collabor collaborative research over a period of years where they understand the give and take of, of, uh, of a meaningful interaction, uh, may be more uh, amenable to a really broad interaction um, uh, within an, an, an international network rather than just the you know, usual in investigator-initiated grant. The, you know, the problem, uh, well, academic science in the US has been enormously successful. I benefited from, from uh, in individual NIH grant support for many years, but the reward structure in academic science favors the individual or the individual's small team. It doesn't really favor meaningful give and take collaborations. In fact, young faculty who join a, a department, a, a basic science department, who spend too much time collaborating with other investigators can be punished for that um, because it becomes po impossible for the faculty colleagues to evaluate that person for promotion if they haven't established an individual track record. Uh, it seems kind of absurd that collaborations would actually be devalued uh, by, by the academic community. In any case, that was, uh, Kemeny and I came to that conclusion, and so we wanted to uh, develop a mechanism to identify teams of investigators who knew the give and take of collaboration and to uh, have a strategy to deploy a, a, a rather large sum of money uh, to encourage several basic science efforts that we had identified in this committee uh, that I ended up chairing. Well, so we can think of Parkinson's as a puzzle. We know some of the pieces. We know alpha-synuclein, which I've told you about. There are 
aspects of the disease where structures like the Lewy body fail to be degraded. We know that mitochondrial dysfunction can play a role. We know that there's a neuroinflammatory component associated with the demise of dopaminergic neurons. And we know ultimately that these cells, the dopaminergic neurons, are propelled into apoptotic death if the mitochondrion is damaged. But the puzzle is much more complicated than this. I told you that there are at least 20 different genes, and 70% of Parkinson patients uh, have no obvious genetic component. They are lumped together as a kind of a sporadic source of the disease. The, the objective of this network that I'll describe to you now is to bring uh, diverse talents together in a uh, really intimate uh, but virtual setting where collaboration is fostered, encouraged, and rewarded as opposed to, si to, to simply just individual creativity. Uh, through the efforts of, uh, of um, neuroscientists that we consulted, we focused on four themes for this basic science approach. The first is the most obvious, and that is the 20 genes that we know of, the genetics and the associated biochemistry, biology, cell biology of these gene products. So we have a number of people focused on LARC2, on synuclein, on PINK1 and PARKIN and some of the other genes, trying to make sense of how they may influence the viability of dopaminergic neurons. We also have a sense that the uh, inflammatory response often accompanying lesions in the brain, not only of Parkinson's, but of Alzheimer's, may be exacerbated by um, ce cells within the brain or by the uh, immune system in the body. So this uh, neuroimmunology approach is, uh, is a separate column of our efforts. Uh, I showed you that picture of the enormously complex dopaminergic neuron. The circuitry with which that neuron interacts with, with cells in the striatum is, is pretty um, poorly developed. How uh, Lewy bodies may progress along the vagus nerve up to the brain is, is, uh, can be recapitulated in experimental animals. Does that have any bearing on, on the disease in humans? So uh, neural circuitry is an area of, of, of importance to us. And finally, there is a often very prolonged prodromal period that can be decades in length uh, where people have symptoms that often progress to Parkinson's. Like I, as I mentioned, a poorly developed sense of smell or um, uh, uh, gut disorders. But one one symptom in particular that progresses to Parkinson's with something like eighty uh, percent uh, efficiency is a syndrome called REM sleep disorder, uh, where patients uh, find uh, that they lose their ability to discriminate sleep and wakeful thoughts. They live out nightmares during their sleep. And they often throw themselves from bed or they flail around and they harm themselves or, or their partner. It can be a very serious and frightening uh, um, uh, syndrome. And uh, patients with REM sleep disorder are now a discrete population that's known and being studied. And with 80% uh, certainty, these patients progress usually within five years to Parkinson's disease. What the connection is between this uh, disorder and Parkinson's is, is, is not well understood. But the hope is that uh, markers will be found that may uh, associate, be associated with REM sleep disorder uh, and then could be used to monitor progression of the disease. In fact, there are no markers other than a physical, physical symptoms uh, that neurologists can use to diagnose Parkinson's. Um, and that's a, a source of some frustration. Success in, heart in treating heart disease and cancer has depended upon being able to follow cells or proteins that are associated with pathology. There is no such uh, molecular or cellular diagnostic as of yet for Parkinson's. So let me then uh, conclude uh, with a couple of uh, slides that talk about sort of the, the ethics of, of uh, our approach. Um, so I, I, I've, I've emphasized, and I, I can't emphasize enough, what we are looking for in selecting teams who applied for funding are ind individuals who have shown a gift in collaboration. And Dario Lessi has kind of been the poster child for this effort. He has always uh, reached out to others uh, to, to bring in technologies that he doesn't have in his lab in Dundee, and he's been enormously successful. And he doesn't usually care where his name appears on a paper, and he certainly doesn't care where the paper appears 
appears in a journal. He's not big on publishing in Cell Nature and Science. He just wants the science to get done. And that's a that's a, a talent that I really appreciate. So we have, over the course of the last two and a half years, identified teams from hundreds of, of team applicants. We've identified 35 teams with uh, between three and five principal investigators. Uh, the teams have to have at least one early career scientist. They have to be uh, gender balanced. Uh, they have to be uh, collaborations between at least two different institutions. So we have 163 PIs, 35 teams in 80 different institutions and something like eight countries around the world. Um, we wanted to attract people from outside of Parkinson's. Many of the teams had only one representative who'd worked on any aspect of Parkinson's. Some are, have been working on Parkinson's for years. We wanted, as I said, to have young investigators who were just at the outset of their career. Um, the, the, the themes, the four themes that, that I mentioned in my previous slide are, are the entire focus of this effort. We fund only basic science. We are not funding drug discovery. We are not funding clinical trials. Uh, however, the investigators that we've selected are very entrepreneurial. Many of them already have companies, and the expectation is that they can take their discoveries and uh, develop IP and move with, the, with that work uh, through other sources of funding. We certainly encourage that, but everything that we do in the network, with now hundreds of uh, investigators, including postdocs and graduate students, everything that's done in our network must be published. Um, must be posted on an archive as it's ready to be published. It must be published in an open access format. And the entire network, which is linked um, in an elaborate uh, online connection, uh, all the investigators are asked to contribute, not just what they've published already, but more importantly, what they're doing, their ideas, their protocols, their reagents, all to be shared within the network um, in this uh, kind of protected environment. So we embrace uh, values of openness and transparency among the network uh, and expect people to share uh, all of their preliminary results in an open manner. So then just to summarize, I've already mentioned this, we have 35 teams. We've given uh, almost $300 million to these teams for just a three-year period. Each team uh, has a grant of uh, uh, around $9 million, which is uh, significant funding. Um, we've also given money to independent programs. There's a very important organization called PPMI, P Parkinson Progression Monitoring uh, Index, uh, where thousands of Parkinson patients have signed on to provide genomic, genetic, um, molecular, um, and um, cellular tissue samples uh, to be, to be uh, distributed to uh, qualified investigators. And the hope is that with having thousands of patients being followed so closely, we'll find some evidence of markers that would be more diagnostic. So we've given an enormous a grant to PPMI. We've also funded a major NIH effort, uh, an international consortium of genomic experts uh, who are collecting um, ge genomic material samples from around the world so that we're not just focused on North American Caucasians, so that we have a more representative uh, uh, understanding of all the mutations that can um, predisposed to Parkinson. So it is a, a, is a, a growing network. We've now uh, been, been operating for about two and a half years. Um, the teams will be evaluated within the next year, and we will be evaluating them for uh, continuing funding or for renewal of funding. And we've developed uh, criteria that we think apply in uh, our that match our value system, which is to look for teams who are really engaged in collaboration as opposed to just individual uh, um, publications. So uh, it's a big gamble, maybe a billion dollar gamble. Um, Mr. Brin is an unusual benefactor. Uh, unlike uh, Zuckerberg or, or, or Gates, he's completely hands off. I had trouble actually getting to meet him uh, because he kept canceling appointments that I'd made to visit with him. And when I first finally met him after a couple of years on, on this project, I tapped him on the shoulder at, a, at an event that I know he would go to, and I introduced myself, and he looked at me, and he said, uh, I'm sorry, have we met? Do I know you? And I said, well, actually, I've been running this program on Parkinson's for you for the past two years. Oh, that, he said. Oh, yes, we're very grateful. <laughs> so 
So I thought, well, what a gig to have a billion dollars to spend as I wish with no no uh, control at the top. So out of that, uh, I, I feel quite strongly that, that good will come. Uh, it won't come today or tomorrow, but it will come. And uh, that's the hope that I have for, for people who, who have the, the history that I've had. Thank you. 